All right, we are now ready to go. In this video, we will see how to create and set up a new Substance Designer project, as well as a few tips and tricks to quickly get you started. So let's open up Designer. And on the top left corner, we're going to click on New Substance Graph. We are presented with this window, and the first thing it asks us is to name that new graph that we are creating. I'm going to call this one Ornit Fabric. You don't have to worry too much about the information below. The default settings are fine in most cases, and these properties can all be changed later on. See, you can change these values at any time. The 2048 resolution is also a good starting point, so let's just leave it as is. Below are the template information. They are directly referring to the template that is selected on the left. In this case, it's the default PBR metallic roughness template. What this means is that if you choose this template, Designer will automatically set up output nodes for each of these channels. For the sake of this tutorial, we'll set our template to empty so that we can start from scratch. Then simply press OK. And here we go. We now have this beautiful blank canvas to start working from. Exciting, don't you think? Now, before we begin, let's just have a look at our file explorer on the left. As you can see, our graph is here with the name we gave it, and it sits within a substance package that is yet unnamed and unsaved. So let's do that first. Select the package and click on the Save icon. Now, everything we will add to this project, be it resources, other graphs, 3D meshes, etc., it will all be stored in that package. So let's just go back to our graph by double clicking it. All right, here we are in the middle of our main working space. It is completely empty, so now is finally the time to start building things. You may have noticed that our graph comes with a little warning sign in the file explorer. If we hover over it, it displays the same message as the one at the bottom here, saying that we have no output. It's fine, and you can totally start working without them, but setting up outputs can be useful to preview our work in the 3D view. Right now, if I add any node, for example, a uniform color node, I can only see it as a 2D image here in my 2D view, while my default cube remains gray. So one of the first things we will need is a setup that allows us to preview in the 3D view the information we manipulate. There are different ways to do this. For example, if I right-click my node and drag it all the way down to the 3D view and let go, Designer will ask me which channel it belongs to. There's a bunch of them, as you can see. And if I choose base color, now my color node is reflected both in the 2D view and in the 3D view. This is one way of doing it, but it can be tedious to repeat this step each time for each channel. Instead, we will go for a simpler method and add a node that will pack all the channels we need for us and generate corresponding outputs. So how can we do that? Now would be a good time to learn how to add nodes in our working space. You actually saw me doing it just a moment ago. I went over to the toolbar at the top, grabbed one of these and placed it in the graph. This colorful row that you see right here contains what we call the atomic nodes. They are the fundamental bricks of Substance Designer. All the other nodes are made with a combination of these and they cannot be broken down into smaller elements. This toolbar is very handy, but we won't find all the nodes available here. For that, we need to go to the library. If I need, for example, a noise or a grunge map, I can come over to the texture category to see what I have and just grab whatever node I find interesting. Now, these two methods are especially useful in the beginning. When you first start exploring Substance Designer, they will help you grasp the different tools as well as their underlying logic. So I really encourage you to just navigate the library and try out random nodes. Also, don't forget that you can find tooltips pretty much everywhere in Designer. So if you're not sure what a node does, just hover over it to find out. All right, let's just get rid of these by dragging a selection around them and pressing delete. There is one more way to add nodes that I haven't talked about, and this is how we'll be adding nodes most of the times throughout this course. Make sure your graph is active by clicking anywhere in the working space, then press spacebar or tab. This will open up a quick search where you can type in anything. By default, it will display the atomic node, the same as here, but as soon as you start typing in something like let's say blur, for example, it will filter out all the blurring nodes available. So we not only have the atomic blur, but also several other nodes like slow blur, radial blur, non-uniform blur, etc. Using this quick search is also a great way to discover new nodes. You can't know the whole library by heart. I certainly don't, yet I've been using Designer for years now. 
So when I'm looking for a certain effect, but don't know if there is a node for that, I just type an approaching name in the quick search. So these were three ways of adding nodes in your graph. Grabbing them from the toolbar, from the library, or searching for them in the quick search. Most of the times, we'll just use that last method. Now let's look for the first node to add to our current project. I'm going to press spacebar and type in base. Here we want to bring in the base material node. It may seem counterintuitive, but this node that we are adding first is actually going to be the very last of our graph and is going to sit at the very right of a node arrangement. The reason for that is that we want to use it as a mean to quickly and easily preview our work. So everything we are going to build will converge towards it to be displayed in the 3D view. Since it's a material node, it contains all the different channels we need, so we won't have to create individual outputs for each of them. And we'll have everything neatly packed in one node, which I find easier to handle. Now, do you remember how we can display a node in the 3D view? We right-click it and drag and drop it in the 3D view. This time, no need to assign anything, the node does it for us. Alternatively, we could right-click it and select View in 3D view. Now, what we are seeing in our 3D view is the result of this material node we added, so if we change anything in its parameters, it will update in real time, which is exactly what we wanted. Let's just take a moment to go over the parameters. Remember that this panel on the right is context sensitive, so it will display the properties of the element that is currently active. At the top, we have the base parameters that are common to all the nodes and that we won't touch for now. Then we have the attributes. We don't need to look into those right now, so you can just collapse them. And finally, the instance parameters that are specific to this node. Now, if we scroll down a little, we can see that we have options and sliders corresponding to each map. First, we have the color. It's set to gray by default, which is actually perfect for a start as we don't want to be distracted with bright hues in the beginning. Next up is the metallic slider. You may have noticed that as soon as we dropped our material in the 3D view, it turned the cube metallic. And that's because the metallic map is set to white, which means fully metallic. So let's just turn it off completely for now. The roughness is fine, maybe a tad too smooth. So let's just increase it a little by pushing the slider to the right. Again, these early adjustments are just meant to get us started. We will change them later on during this course. Now, if we keep scrolling down, we have this user-defined map section at the bottom. What this means is that for each channel, we can decide if we want it to be driven by one of the built-in sliders, like the one we just tweaked, or by a custom map that we could plug into the node. So, for example, if I activate the base color by setting it to true, an input automatically pops up on the left, letting me plug a custom image here. The yellow dot indicates that it's expecting a color input, so let's just grab a uniform color node like so. Or we could just type in color in the search bar. And now let's make our first connection, shall we? To do so, just click once on the output and let go. You don't have to hold, just release your click and the connection will follow. You can now pan, holding your middle mouse button while keeping the connection attached. And now let's just connect it by clicking once more on the input. Ta-da! Congratulations, you just connected two nodes. You see that the color of a base material node is now driven by this node and that our original color palette has disappeared. Now we said earlier that we don't want a bright color to begin with, so let's just delete this and deactivate the base color once more by setting it to false. If you followed the first videos of this series, you know that we usually start by building the height of a material before tackling its color or roughness. So which maps should we enable here? You may be tempted to say, well, the height map, obviously, but we'll actually let this one turned off at first. The reason for that is that the height channel in Designer is used to drive the displacement, which is a heavy process that we'll introduce a bit later. So yes, we are going to build the height map, but we are going to preview it through two other maps, the normal map and the ambient occlusion map. So let's just enable both of these. All right, we're almost set and ready to go. There's one last step we need to perform. These two inputs we enabled require specific data and we can't feed them grayscale information directly. So we need to bring two little companion nodes to fix this. Let's start with the normal you see that it's expecting a color input. If we look for normal in our search bar, 
we have a normal node that computes a normal map from a grayscale image, which is exactly what we need. Let's add it. And let's just increase its intensity to three here in the specific parameters. As for the ambient occlusion, it will create shadows based on height information. Since the input is empty, it has turned the cube fully black. But if we search for occlusion, we see that we have two ambient occlusion nodes. I'm going to go for the RTA01, which is ray traced ambient occlusion. It's the most accurate, but it's also a bit heavy, so feel free to use the horizon based one instead. Let's connect it. Okay. And so from now on, any information we create will be fed to these two nodes that converge to a final base material, letting us see in real time what our height looks like. All right, let's recap what we just saw in this video. You now know how to create a new substance graph. Remember that the default settings are fine in most cases and that you can always change them later on. Your new graph will be placed in a substance package that contains everything related to your project. Just don't forget to save it when you start. You also learned how to add and connect your first nodes. I see you in the next video where we will start working on the fabric itself.